Hello, good afternoon. My name is Rodri. Um, this is the uh, fourth, I believe, in the series of the uh, St John's Chambers PI uh, lockdown webinars. Um, from the comfort of my home uh, to the comfort of your home, hopefully. Um, uh, this will be available on, on YouTube afterwards on the uh, YouTube channel um, of St John's. Uh, and I understand that you, in order to get that, you can register your interest and watch it back if you're unable to watch it just now. Um, I had the, the, the pleasure of watching um, a couple of the other ones before. Um, uh, certainly, I've had a look this morning at Marcus Coates Walker and Rob Mills. Uh, doing their update on clinical negligence. And I thought that was particularly interesting and in some ways dovetails into to, to, uh, my, um, uh, my talk today about material contribution. Certainly a couple of the cases that they mentioned, uh, namely Collier and Mid-Essex Hospital Services and Marshall and Shembury, um, both of these cases deal with uh, causation um, in um, a clinical negligence situation and where there was um, certainly in, in Marshall and Shembury, a large number of unknowns, um, but uh, as I understand it, they weren't pled in terms of material contribution. Um, this is a, an interactive uh, webinar, and certainly if you look at, there's, there should be a, 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 a toolbox in the middle of your screen there, and it should have two boxes on it, one of which has a question mark on it. If you push those, then you can enter a question, and hopefully at the end of the end of the seminar, um, if I'm uh, feeling uh, energetic enough, I can answer those questions um, and uh, and uh, be able to to do that and address that um, live at the end of this. I hope this is going to be a, a fairly short and sweet um, topic. And um, there's obviously some background elements to it, which I think we'll need to cover, which many of you will be completely familiar with. But so I don't intend to dwell on those. Um, and then um, we'll look at a couple of cases. So so what specifically are we looking at? today is just covering um, a couple of well-known cases, the top two, Wilshire and Bailey, which um, many of you will obviously know in terms of the formulation of the, the principle of material contribution. And then looking at a couple of modern day classics as they were, Williams and Bermuda and Cedar John and Central Manchester. Uh, and then looking at a couple of other cases at the end there, um, ASCII and Cambridge University and Andrews and Greater Glasgow uh, Health, Health Board, I should say Health Board. Um, as uh, a way of looking at how the court has approached uh, the, um, the issue of material contribution most recently. Um, obviously, the, the principle of this arose originally in industrial disease cases. Uh, and I, I'm just going to mention and name check the cases of McGee and National Coal Board and Bonnington's Casting and Ward Law, which both involved the, the movement of dust, one onto somebody's claimant skin and the other into their lungs. Um, and it's also worth mentioning, I think, in terms of industrial disease cases, the case of Fairchild and Glenhaven funeral services, which obviously involved um, asbestos. Um, in clinical negligence cases, um, the material contribution uh, applies to indivisible injuries, and they are often things like death, uh, heart attack and um, brain damage. Um, and where the, the pathological and physiological processes um, that have brought these events um, to pass um, it is unclear. There's an element of which um, is referred to as scientific uncertainty in, in how they came into being. Um, I put this quote here. It's a kind of long quote, and it's just to really um, set the scene in terms of uh, in terms of causation in clinical negligence. Um, this is uh, obviously from Greg and Scott. This is a loss of chance case, and Lord Hoffman is quoting an article from Helen Rees. And I'll just take you to the top and the bottom of this, which is in red. Everything has a determinant cause, even if we do not know what it is. Everything is determined by causality. What we lack is knowledge, and the law deals with lack of knowledge by the concept of the burden of proof. Now, this deals with a couple of cases, a couple of um, concepts. Firstly, that, there's a, that there is a certain magic in law in that it fills the gaps sometimes where evidence is lacking. And it also, um, perhaps what Lord Hoffman is more specifically saying in the last sentence, is that it's still um, incumbent upon the claimant um, to prove um, the material contribution has happened. The burden is very much still on the claimant in these kinds of cases. Um, it's, 
I'm just this this slide's probably a slightly morbid slide with a picture of a grave there, but it's um it's just to point out that in terms of ca uh, causation, material um, but for causation can can deal with when can deal easily with when there's one identifiable negligent causal factor, um, and it's it struggles when there's more than one factor. It's not to say that it can't deal with um, competing factors. It's just that that. Uh, com the competing factors uh, out of them, one of them has to show that one of them, um, that the negligent factor bore greater than 50% of the responsibility to make the, uh, reach the burden, reach the um, the, the point of uh, uh, the threshold, sorry, for, for um, but for causation. So in multiple causative agents, um, these can be uh, very often in clinical negligence cases, uh, pathological processes, physiological processes and negligent agents and non-negligent injuries, which often exist either concurrently um, or, or, or sequentially. And material contribution has been, been developed in clinical negligence in order to reflect the, compl the complexities of these issues. Um, certainly, I, I put a little point there at the bottom that says question of degree. And in terms of the, the, the relative potency of, uh, of factors such as negligent factors or negligent agents um, in, um, contribu in, in contribution, um, this is suggested as stated by Lord Reed in Bonington that such an agent needs to um, be anything more than minimal. So anything that fits outside the, um, the de minimis um, uh, rule. Um, looking now to first case, um, which I won't um, uh, go on about extensively, this is Wiltshire and Essex. Um, this was obviously a, a case that's, that's well known in terms of the, the uh, establishing the rules of material contribution. Um, this was a, a premature baby that was resuscitated rather overzealously by a junior doctor, um, providing large amounts of oxygen to them under the circumstance. And then over the course of a number of days, um, the oxygen levels were found to be raised and the claimant developed, unfortunately, a condition called retrolental fibroplasia, which is effectively rendered the, the claimant blind or partially blind. Um, now, there were five different causes which were identified as being potentially causative in this case. Um, not only the, the overzealous application of um, oxygen, but also the carbon dioxide levels, um, as well as um, intraventricular hemorrhage, that's a bleed inside the brain, um, apnea. So in terms of the premature birth, there was periods where no oxygen was given, as well as periods of time where considerable amounts of oxygen was, was given. And also that the claimant had a patent ductus arteriosus, which is a congenital heart defect. Now, the claimant had suffered from all of these problems uh, in the first two months of life, each one of which was considered to be the sole cause of the blindness. So just looking at this case, what that was um, the, the court didn't find for the for the claimant, but that it was considered that there was a it was an area of uncertainty in terms of the, the medical cause. But the factors that were in play were all very discrete or disparate factors. And it wasn't clear which factor of those five um, was was specifically responsible for it. And more importantly, that out of those potential causes, um, they didn't consider, the court didn't consider them to be cumulative. Um, so they weren't uh, interacting with one another. In the case of Bailey and the Ministry of Defence, um, this is a case where uh, a, there was a pathological process that was non-negligent, the, the claimant had uh, non-negligent gallstones. Um, at the uh, defendant hospital, the claimant had a um, a, a procedure to try and remove these gallstones, uh, uh, an ERCP, which is essentially an endoscopy which goes beyond the stomach to look at the common bile duct. Um, that procedure was undertaken non-negligently, but the, the negligence within the case, as was claimed by the, the claimants, by the claimant, um, was that following that ERCP procedure, the um, the, the claimant was. Uh, was was not resuscitated properly, so they failed to to provide appropriate fluid resuscitation um, after the ERCP. The the claimant then went on to be transferred to an NHS hospital where they had two further operations. Um, after which the claimant vomited, uh, aspirated her vomit, uh, had a cardiac arrest, and went on to have um, uh, unfortunately um, brain damage. Um, 
in Bailey, there was clearly numerous factors that are in play, both the, the non-negligent factors of the operations uh, and then the negligent factor of the fluid resuscitation. Um, the court found that these were in fact cumulative uh, in causing the weakness um, and also that they were indivisible, um, that this was an area of scientific uncertainty um, as to what caused the weakness, but all those factors were material in doing so and the negligent factor specifically was one of those factors and that it was more than negligible in its contribution uh, to the weakness. Um, I put a quote here from that case, so it's Waller at paragraph 46. This is the reason why I've included this. This is a uh, this is the quote that people uh, claimants often re reach to um, when they're seeking to to plead or, or make out material contribution and um, that it sets out that there needs to be a case where medical certainty cannot be established um, and um, the but, but for test in those circumstances can be um, modified. Um, a more recent case is that of Williams and Bermuda Hospitals Board. Now, um, this case um, was originally uh, heard in Bermuda. Um, it was appealed and then subsequently heard by the Privy Council. Um, Mr Williams, in this case, uh, was a claimant who developed appendicitis was seen at the, the defendant's hospital um, and uh, developed, went on to develop peritonitis, sepsis and had a uh, myocardial infarction, a heart attack. Um, the, the defendants did operate upon the claimant and um, uh, removed the uh, appendix, the offending appendix, but not before peritonitis had started to happen. Um, in that, the claimants claimed that there had been a delay in treatment. Um, some of which was negligent, some of which was non-negligent. The, the, the judge found in at first instance that there had been somewhere in the region of between two and four hours of delay, which could be attributed to the negligence of the of the defendant. Um, and certainly it was this delay in treatment um, not being the only factor um, that was established by the negligent, but it was in the mix with these other um, physiological and pathological processes. Now, going back to McGee, which is a, this um, one of the industrial cases that I mentioned at the beginning. In McGee, there was negligent and non-negligent types of dust, um, but it was the same causative agent. Um, the defendant in the Williams case, therefore, argued by applying this case that, um, that the agents have to be the same and they have to act concurrently rather than consecutively. The importance, I think, therefore, of this case is that the Privy Council um, extended the principle when ages act as part of a single continuous process. That is to say, um, when um, non-negligent and negligent factors act um, consecutively, it can still make out a um, material contribution. Um, and I've just summed it up there. So there's been numerous factors, um, that being um, the non-negligent non and negligent delays, as well as the pathological process which was obviously non-negligent, the appendicitis. And all of these factors were cumulative and indivisible in causing the sepsis. Um, and each one of them, and specifically the, the negligent factor of the, um, the delay in time between two and four hours, was more than negligible in its contribution to the sepsis. Um, this again is a case that arose in 2016. Um, this is a case of Cedo John, um, who was a claimant who who was a GP at the time, who just before Christmas um, fell down and uh, suffered a head injury um, and was admitted to hospital. Um, this is a uh, claimant who had, um, a, as a child, some um, brain injury, um, which had left him with some minor neurological deficits. Um, so he came into hospital and it was, a, uh, it, was, it was claimed by the claimant that there were two negligent periods of delay in undertaking the, the CT scan, which diagnosed um, the, 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 the bleed inside his head, and also a delay in a transfer to neurosurgery at a separate hospital. Um, that was fairly farcical in that uh, one ambulance turned up, was sent away, and it wasn't until another ambulance turned up a number of hours later, or sometime later, that, um, that the, the claimant was actually transferred. Um, the two negligent periods of delay um, were, were thought to be somewhere in the region of, of six hours. So the counterfactual timeline that was created by the court suggested that the claimant should have been on the operating table at Hope Hospital at quarter to two in the afternoon, but in fact, they weren't actually transferred and, 
and, and ready for surgery until half past seven in the evening. Now, the, the key issue in this case is that the, the claimant had raised intracranial pressure preoperatively, and it was felt that the, the length of time over which it was raised was considered material to the brain injury that had been caused. Um, also, it's worth noting that there had been a post-operative um, non-negligent infection that caused further injury. So in the mix, there was numerous factors. Um, the initial injury, the um, pre-operative raised intracranial pressure and the post-operative infection, um, all of which um, coalesced and, and caused and contributed to the brain injury. Now, the trust defendant argued that Bailey and Williams had no application as they involved uh, a singular causative agent. In Bailey, that was the weakness, uh, and in and Williams, that was the sepsis. Um, the causative agents, they said, in this case, the injury, uh, the pressure and the infection were discrete and independent, and therefore more like the case of, of Wiltshire with the five independent causes of the, of, of the child's blindness. The trust argued in the alternative that the, the court should try and apportion the damage between the tortious and the non-tortious causes. Um, so in this case, the court made a number of findings, which in some ways clarified the, the present position on material contribution. Um, the court did apply material contribution and allowed the claimant to recover without any degree of apportionment. Um, it also made clear that material contribution applies just as much to multiple causative agents as it does to a single causative agent, um, either acting together um, or at the same time or sequentially. Um, what was notable about this is that there was obviously going to be a difficulty in apportioning the um, the, the damages between the the different um, between the different injuries that had happened both negligently and um, uh, uh, and non negligently. Although it did appear from the judgment there was a degree of apportionment um, re that reflected the um, degree of injury that was caused non-negligently. It was found within the, within the judgment that the, the claimant would not have been able to return to work in any event, having suffered the initial injury. And although the injuries were discrete, they were arguably not independent of each other, as per um, the defendants argued, as in Wiltshire. Um, looking at a, a more recent case from 2019 of how the courts have sought to, to look and um, apply material contribution. This is the case of Margaret Askey in Cambridge University Hospitals. Um, this is a case where the claimant was uh, presented to A&E having suffered from a warning or sentinel bleed from a cerebral aneurysm. Um, the claimant appeared in A&E and uh, the symptoms which she portrayed weren't barn door symptoms of having a cerebral aneurysm um, according to the to the to the medical uh, the treating medical um, clinicians um, she just appeared vague and, and was, they thought she was acting in a way that was quite difficult and they but they thought it was behavioral rather than anything significant going on so quite subtle her symptoms that she presented with but she was according to her family very different from how she normally presented she was sent home and then she went on to have a, a significant intracerebral bleed. Um, the defendant hospital admitted breach of duty, but contested causation because they said that even had the defendant, even had the claimant been admitted to hospital um, at the time when she was sent home, um, she wouldn't have had the operation until the following morning. And therefore her being in hospital wouldn't have altered the outcome. Now, the claimant submitted that being sent home would have changed the outcome, um, stating that the claimant at home would have had an increased blood pressure. And by having this increased blood pressure, that would have materially would have caused or materially contributed to the aneurysm inside her head rupturing. Now, this case is renowned for the judge's criticism um, of the claimant's uh, ill-prepared expert rather than its findings on material contribution. Nevertheless, um, Mr. Justice Martin Spencer considered the claimant's case on material contribution and he recognised that whereas there were multiple potential causative factors um, and there were of them one of which which could have been related to the raised blood pressure. However, he found um, in finding a fact that there was no evidence to suggest that it would have been raised at home. This he 
he stated within his judgment would have required there to be, for example, some uh, a study to have undertaken whether there'd been some comparative data on patients who were sent home from A&E and those who are kept in, in hospital in terms of their blood pressure under the specific circumstance of having a cerebral aneurysm. Obviously, this evidence was not available and such a study had not been um, not been undertaken. And so therefore, the, the claimants couldn't succeed. Um, in terms of um, his, his findings, he, he did um, uh, consider that rather than it being a material um, contribution, that there was a potentially a risk, an increased risk of injury as opposed to being a material factor in um, formulating or causing the injury itself. Um, this quote I put at the top here is from um, McGee and National Coal Board. And what he says is what the House of Lords is saying that in certain circumstances where a claimant can, can prove that the breach of duty increased the risk of an adverse outcome, the court will draw an inference that the breach of duty made a material contribution. So effectively what he's saying from that is that the, the claimants need to adduce evidence that their, their factor um, is material so that the, the increase in blood pressure was a material factor rather than a hypothetical risk factor. Um, he also went on to acknowledge that there are circumstances which exist where a court may be willing to take, as he put it, a leap of faith to convert the risk into causation. This is to say that inferences can be drawn to, to fill that uh, evidential gap um, in certain types of cases. Um, looking here at just my last case, this is a case that was heard in Scotland in the Court of Session of the Outer House. Um, this is in some ways has similar facts to the, pre to the previous case, but was found um, very differently in terms of, uh, 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 of, uh, of whether liability was made out in terms of the claimant. In this case, it was. Um, uh, the claimant developed an ischemic bowel secondary to a, a mesenteric artery thrombus. That is a clot that was blocking her arterial supply to her bowel. Um, she was seen by a junior doctor who, uh, as with the previous case, discharged her home. Um, uh, the claimant was admitted to hospital the next day and died the following day from, from this um, um, ischemic bowel. The defendant's position was that had the junior doctor admitted her, she would have died in any event and therefore could not, causation could not be made out, similar again to the, to the previous case. Um, Breach of duty was established, um, wasn't admitted by the defendants, but was established. And the defendant um, disputed that the court could establish but for causation on the grounds, quite specifically, that the timing of the ischemic event, the ischemic event to the bowels could not be precisely pinpointed. Um, in the matter of causation, it was established that in a counterfactual chronology, um, that there wasn't really any practical way that the claimant could establish when this ischemic event in fact occurred. The, the judge in this case, who is Lord Pentland, um, applied both the cases of Bailey and Williams to this. Um, applying Bailey, uh, I, I've mentioned here, and this was noted within the judgment of Lord Pentland, um, he obviously made the took the, the lead from the from Waller in paragraph 46 again of um, Bailey and Ministry of Defence, um, where the situation that he felt that was that the claimant was putting forward was one of a of a scientific uncertainty. It couldn't be said with any certainty um, at what point um, the claimant's bowel had um, had um, became a ischemic, and also applied Williams um, to state that this was a in many ways analogous to the case of Williams that this was a single and indivisible septic process. Um, and that the delay in ordering an immediate CT resulted in the respondent being exposed to a materially longer period of ischemia. So that was the position in Williams. In this case, it, 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 the judge found it to be analogous in that there was a period of time over which the patient's bowel in, in his findings um, was likely to be um, ischemic. Um, in terms of the contribution, um, the judge stated that it was material in the sense that it made a real and this is a quote of a meaningful or significant contribution towards the towards the death. So um, maybe specifically set out there what this meaning of material in more so than just the de minimis term um, would mean. Um, in fact, of the case, the, the judge found for the claimant both on the application of the but for test and by the application of, of material contribution. So 
just looking at this um, uh, checklist, as it were, um, of when material contribution um, might be or may be applicable. Um, if there is one potential causative factor of the injury or loss, then perhaps the but for test would be the most appropriate test. It's sometimes also worth noticing, and this was um, this was considered um, to be relevant in the case of um, Williams, the Privy Council thought that the case of Bailey perhaps was, was wrongly founded and perhaps the most appropriate way of dealing that would be um, that the, the claimant would be found for, but in terms of but for causation, applying um, not the case of material contribution, but rather um, the notion of but for, but for causation to the eggshell skull principle. Um, so that they were simply saying that there was another way around of finding Bailey um, for, for, the, for the claimant, um, but perhaps by applying just simple but for causation. So perhaps it's worth considering whether um, that can be applied um, rather than um, resorting to material contribution. Um, the other factors there was whether there's been multiple potential causative factors, whether they are negligent and non-negligent, and whether the role of the negligent factor is more than, mini more than minimal. And um, as in the, the previous case I've just discussed, whether it was um, meaningful and significant. Um, furthermore, it might be possible to say whether these factors interacted or whether the process is understood or clear and how these um, factors operated. So there's a number of points that a claimant might need to have a look at and, and, and think about in terms of the factual matrix of the case. Um, before perhaps just in the alternative pleading um, material contribution. So just looking at this in terms of, a, of my summary, um, material contribution is a modification of the but-for test. It's been considered that perhaps it, it, it sits somewhere between but-for causation and establishing causation by way of a material increase in risk, which doesn't have much traction in terms of um, uh, clinical negligence cases. Um, it doesn't, as I've said here, provide a get out of jail free card where there are evidential gaps. So what I would say to that is that material contribution applies where medical science cannot provide an answer rather than where there is insufficient evidence to support um, to, to support the case. So it's still upon the claimant um, to provide enough evidential basis um, to uh, allow certain factors um, to be considered as being material and so apply material contribution. Um, I've written here material contribution involves inferences. Um, certainly in the cases, some of the cases I've looked at, the court has made significant inferences. In Bailey, for example, uh, the court inferred that the effect of the negligence on the 11th and 12th of January was to prevent the claimant from being unable to prevent the aspiration of their vomit um, 14 days later on the 26th of January. So that's a significant uh, inference that they, they've made there. Um, and in Williams, the Privy Council um, specifically noted that it was entitled to infer on the balance of probabilities that a negligent delay in that case made a contribu material contribution, um, sorry, to the injuries. So this goes as far as to point to the fact that the uh, court has to be persuaded to, to make a leap of faith, uh, as was um, suggested uh, in the case of um, uh, in the case of in the case of Margaret Askey, um, in that case the judge wasn't prepared to make a leap of faith. Um, in that they considered that the agent that was being um, the, the negligent agent um, was a, actually in fact a, a, an increase in risk rather than an agent an agent that could be said to be have materially contributed to the injury. But and my final point here, it may be worth noticing that judges and courts can be persuaded in the interest of justice um, to make that leap of faith um, where the but for test would require um, the claimant to prove the impossible, as in the case of um, Andrews. Um, and this was noted, especially in the case as well of, of Williams. Um, so there, that's my summary of, uh, an, of my roundup of material contribution. I hope you haven't found it um, uh, too too long or, or trodden over too much ground that you know already. Um, I don't know whether there's any questions that you that you have there. There is there is one question. Um, I don't know how I'll, I'll I'll aim to try and get that up by pushing my button. Please bear with me.
OK, so this is a question from Anonymous. Um, if material contribution isn't alleged in the letter of claim, but it's in the uh, defend if, if but in the defendant's investigations, they identify a breach which may have played a part in the outcome, um, the extent of which is not known. How should they how should, should be pled in the letter of response? Well, I mean, it's. It, I think that very much depends on the on the on the facts of the case. If it's something that perhaps some it, that is a case that's live at the moment, um, then certainly it's it's a tricky issue because you obviously don't want to to bring to the forefront that there may be a material contribution uh, argument. Um, but certainly, it'd be something that um, it, it might be worth just running past your experts under the circumstances. But if it's a, a specific type of, of fact factual matrix, then perhaps it it might be worth just emailing me and and, um, and and getting that across and then I can have a, a consideration of it under those circumstances. I hope I, I know that's a bit of a cop out, but I hope that's um, reasonably helpful. I'll be able to address it then. Um, OK, that's all I have to say for today. I, I hope you've uh, found it short and, and fairly sweet. Um, and uh, I hope you can join us with the other um, with the other um, webinars as part of this series. OK, thank you very much. Good afternoon.